Warning, if you have misophonia, this video might be the worst thing that's ever happened to you. I mean, either way, this is going to be pretty painful, so brace yourself. Now, some of you may be thinking, this is Connor talking, not Nga. Well, to that I say, you're right. Let's give it over to Nga. Happy 2000 subscribers. In other words, welcome to Gumsmack, the language of speaking with your mouth full. Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Nga. <laughs> I gotta say, this is bad. This is, this is really bad. I'm solving a problem here, big problem that exists in our society at large. People are at the dinner table, they're, they're eating their food and all that. There's always these, you know, these awkward silences when, when everyone's chewing on their food, everyone, everyone's just eating and stuff and like the conversation has to pause because people can't talk with their mouth full. But what if you could? And now I know, I know a lot of people, maybe w w with their bad manners, they will speak while they're eating. They'll be making all their pulmonic voiced and voiceless sounds using their vocal cords and their lungs and all that to make sounds and all that talk while they're eating but no no I mean I wanted to make a language where you talk by chewing it would solve the problem right <laughs> you know you know now now it won't be an awkward silence you won't be hearing random chewing while while you're at the dinner table with your family no no this will be purposeful specific creative chewing with meaning. I hate the sound of chewing. I did this to myself. Gum smack. How to speak with your mouth full. A language, a masterpiece, a creative solution to one of time's oldest problems. Created by myself and Eternal yet again. That's how it's written. Um, that, that's the orthography. We'll get into that later. Text below. It may look like IPA, but the IPA doesn't fully do it justice. We'll get into that as well. But the name for the language, gum smack, is pronounced as poetic, isn't it? It's a lot easier to pronounce when you're chewing gum or eating food. So I'm probably gonna be wasting I'm probably gonna be wasting a lot of this gum over the course of this video. What What is gum smack? At a fundamental level, it's a fully non-pulmonic language. It's meant to be spoken while chewing or eating food. Um, it's written using a food emoji based logography. It's transliterated using what Eternal calls the standard gum smack transliteration form, which we'll also get into in a second. And its grammar is also very complicated extremely cursed. Let's get into how, okay? So first, phonology. It's in quotation marks for a reason. It's kind of hard to explain. Uh, the IPA cannot accommodate for what I have done. Now, yes, there are clicks, and I use those click symbols from the IPA to approximate these sounds, but they are not explicitly clicks. Some of them are, but a lot of them are not explicitly clicks, and especially a lot of the more slippery sounds, right? Because the phonemes can't really be divided into consonants and vowels. No, no. Consonants and vowels, throw that out the window. For this, the closest thing we could really come up with was chews and squelches. Here's the phonology. For the chews, we have And for the squelches, we have... The symbol that's represented as the IPA implosive B with a voiceless symbol under it just implies that a chew is done with the mouth either closed the entire time 
or with resonance blocked quickly. That's why there's a difference between the open bilabial click, the and the closed affricate in quotation marks because it causes a bit more of a slide with the p, right? So, versus. Then, mouth spanning is using both your lips and your tongue placed entirely across the entire articulation centers of the mouth, right? So you're literally creating suction across the entire span of your mouth there. And then there's the closed version, which is... Then we have the cluck, which is... It's by slapping your tongue against the bottom of your mouth. There. And then the closed version is just doing it with your mouth closed. Then, on to the squelches. Now, each of the squelch sounds starts with the letter S. And the S just represents the... This is a squelch, or the use of saliva, right? Separate it from normal IPA sounds or any of that. And the normal letter B attached to a squelch means it's a closed squelch, meaning you're doing the squelch with your mouth closed. Okay, now, the syllabic structure, also in quotation marks. Words and gum smack are divided into clusters that can be best described as chew in parentheses, squelch in parentheses. Now, they're both in parentheses because there can be words consisting of just a chew or just a squelch or a chew and a squelch, and most of these words are one to five syllables long. Now I'm gonna stop calling them syllables and start calling them more, because the way that the language flows is meant to be more along the, along like an evenly spaced time scale, right? So you can have a chew and a squelch that can be done in quicker succession, or you could have two chews that occupy two temporal spaces, or two squelches to occupy two temporal spaces. Now, writing in gum smack. This is where things get pretty brutal. The official gum smack orthography is an emoji-based logography, using exclusively the food emojis. Now, in order to get to this food-based emoji logography, you need to understand the standard gum smack transliteration form. Now, think of it kind of like pinyin for mandarin, but <laughs> way less helpful. Uh, so, for example, the sequence right here that you would read as GA4L13A2 is actually the transcription for this word right here, pronounced as and it means misdemeanor in the genitive case. I think there's 122 total graphemes that can be used in various combinations to make up the transliteration and thus the orthography, the, the logography. And you can see that some of these are simple two-symbol representations to show a certain uh, type of food for the, the logography, but sometimes it gets a bit more complicated than that and can become quite cumbersome to read, like heresy being the one for coffee. <laughs> Turning these grapheme sets into words. It was 122. Each of those 122 graphemes can be set up in up to four bushels of 1 to 13 to distinguish meaning. A full logograph is colloquially called a mouthful, for obvious reasons. So with that misdemeanor example, you know, the four green apples, 13 lemons, two red apples, it's made up of three bushels consisting of four green apples, 13 lemons, and two red apples. Thus, its transliteration is GA for L13A2, right? Another important aspect of the written language is that grammatical features are visually appended to the mouthfuls by adding specific graphemes before or after the main body of the word. We're gonna get into more detail on what that means throughout the grammar section. Some grammatical and also morphological features that we're gonna talk about in this section. There's tripartite alignment. So there's nominative, ergative, and accusative. If you don't know what that means, it basically means nominative is used only for intransitive sentences, and ergative is used for ones that are also going to have an accusative in them. So it's separate cases for those different situations. There's a lot of grammatical cases. There's constructates, there's sortals, there's sequence-based verb tenses, tenses also in quotation marks. There are several aspects and moods. There's no active voice, and there's lip harmony, which is more morphological, but again, we're gonna get into why this is in the grammar section in a bit. Gumsmack has 22 cases, most of which are made to compensate for the lack of prepositions in the language. 
So we have nominative, ergative, accusative, genitive, possessive, committative, instrumental, causal, abessive, essive, illative, inessive, elative, allative, adessive, oblative, superessive, delative, subessive, superlative, interessive, and circumessive. Now to decline nouns. Using the rules from that table on the previous slides, um, each infix is actually placed between the penultimate and the ultimate more of any given root word. If the word is only one more along, then the infix will actually end up being a prefix because it'll get placed before the one mora in the word. For infixes which activate lip harmony, as is shown on the table, every case is paired with a lip harmony, which is either not applicable, closed, or open. For infixes which activate lip harmony, the first and sometimes second more in the word which precede the infix are impacted. Most of the time, an opening lip harmony affects the preceding two more, while a closing lip harmony only affects the one immediately preceding mora. Lip harmony affects chews and squelches equally. It does not discriminate. In writing, the case marker is placed following the original root word, no matter what. You're not infixing that. So here is a word that can be declined regularly is the word for marmalade and is written as BU7TT301. These are its uh, declensions. You can take a look at that for a minute. You can see how various things are slightly affected by the lip harmony, depending on what case it's in. And also, when you look at the uh, SGTF, the transliteration form to the right, you can tell that the, uh, the transliteration form does not help you with pronunciation at all. It, now, sortals, or measure words, there's a reason the genitive form is the unmarked form. It's because, not all the time, but a good amount of the time, nouns are preceded either by a direct article or a sortal that specifies the amount, size, and material. The material is divided into solids and liquids. Right? And they are divided into these categories. To represent like a piece of or a part of a larger whole, you'd use either a nibble or a sip. Um, for one unit of something, you would use a bite or a drink of something. Then for a small collection of something, you know, like a pockle kind of situation, you'd say a plate or a gulp. And then for a ton of or all of something, a, a larger plural, you would use a meal or a chug, respectively. And metaphorical concepts are often split between being considered solids and liquids, and that kind of depends on context and on the specific word and the way it's philosophically interpreted. Thus, the word a slice of marmalade would be, oh god. Of course, obviously. Come on. Now, the articles and demonstratives, so there are three proximities. Um, these demonstratives are very important as they're also going to accommodate for the lack of pronouns, which we'll get into soon. There's a single definite article. When the definite article is used, it can supplant any sort of words, unless it's intended to specify like the rarity and specificity of something. If a noun is in the construct state, it loses article and is put into the possessive case, and that's one of the only times that the possessive case is actually used. Now, pronouns, or the lack thereof, there's no specific I, he, she, they, etc. Thus, the many speakers of Gumsmack must create constructions to accommodate for this lack of normal pronouns. And the translation for these pronouns is, for the first person singular, it's this mouth, the plural, this plate of mouths. For the second person singular, it's that nearer mouth. And for plural, it's that nearer plate of mouths. For third person singular, you have that, the further, mouth, and for plural, it is that, the further, plate of mouths. And there's also a more simplified inflection system for pronouns. A lot of them end up kind of combining together. So the sounds will be the same, but the graphics, the, uh, the transliteration form, will be the same. They're still going to use the emojis for all 22 of the cases. You better, you better get studying, because <laughs> there's going to be a test. Verbs. Now, verbs are conjugated for tense and voice. Tense is 
in quotation marks like most things in this language because it can be used to refer to sequences of events and actual temporal relations equally. I'll show you on the next slides. Um, the three voices are passive, middle, and reflexive. There is no grammatical active voice. And then several aspect and mood particles can also be used to add more specificity to verbs. And they come before the verbs, usually. Verb conjugations. So, since there's a lot of definitions that can go into these conjugations, we have renamed them to be more fitting to the language. So, first we have the appetizer, which is preterite, past perfect, past tense overall, or it refers to something happening first in a sequence. Prefixes, they come before the root word that makes up the verb. Now when written the graphic, the, uh, the transliteration form, the graphic is circumscribed around the original verb's glyph. Conjugations are relatively regular, but any closed lip sounds that begin the root word are opened once a verbal prefix is attached. And that happens in the verb to give, as you can see. Now, aspects and moods, they are usually represented as, a, as particles placed before their respective verbs, though there are certain constructions that can also create other aspects and moods than the ones that are listed here. The anterior aspect, the posterior aspect, the iterative aspect, the habitual aspect, the subjunctive mood, the optative mood, and the conditional mood. Conditional statements usually consist of if or followed by a verb in the subjunctive and then the word then which is and then a verb in the conditional mood. They can contain the words if and then but in Gumsmack only then is required. It's very important keep that in mind. I'm testing you. Then subjunctive and optative may both be used in independent clauses to form commands though respectively Subjunctive is a more stern command than optative. Optative is more like an offer, like, may we eat? Um, if a verb needs both an aspect and a mood, then the mood particle is said first, then the aspect, and then the verb. Copulas. <laughs> so copular statements are expressed with the verb to smell like, or to taste like, in the middle voice to describe an equal relationship between the subject and the object slash predicate. The tense of a copular statement can be clarified through conjugation. It can be specifically the appetizer, the main course, or dessert, but most of the time it's a tenseless statement meant for the snack tense, which is a, like a generative gnomic case aspect combo kind of situation. <laughs> adjectives are bad. So adjectives are expressed by using the verb to taste like, as we saw, in the reflexive voice and a noun in the genitive or ablative case that expresses a characteristic. These either occur as independent clauses or as subordinate clauses marked with the subjunctive particle. For example, our first full sentence in gum smack. I'm gonna need gum for this. The sentence, the yellow potato is good, would be pronounced as And is of course written like that. That right there is a complete sentence in gum smack. How do you feel? Do you feel like you've learned something? I think we've all learned something today. It's not over yet. Now adverbs. Adverbs are expressed with a descriptive noun in the assive or ablative case and a verbal prefix. They're graphically represented with the verbal prefix and the nominal suffix. If the adverb is modifying an adjective rather than a verb, it has to carry the snack tense with a voicing that best fits in the context of the clause as a whole. So another sentence example. He ran quickly and it is pronounced Last but not least, the number system. I don't know if I could really say what base Gumsmack uses, because the way the numbers work here, you just create combinations of various different number words, right? The words for the numbers are 
various combinations of imperial measurement units for liquid volume. Now, they're treated grammatically as a component of whatever noun they're preceding, though they're not given any case markings, which makes life a lot easier, honestly. The number of words are ordered from largest to smallest whenever you're saying them. So, as you can see here, we go from minim, which represents a quarter, gill, which is a half, cup, which is one, pint, which is two, quart for four, gallon for 16, peck for 32, bushel for 128, and quarter for 1024. And they each have their associated graphics. The number 37 would be peck, quart, cup, which would be said as... And then 11 would be quart, quart, pint, cup, which would be... There you go. All that information right there, that is all you need to know for the basics of Gum Smack. The most amazing language ever to exist. I'm sure you're all loving it. You all have like this on full volume on your headphones and you're just absolutely loving the sound of my saliva just slither around. Now, there's going to be a link to access the Google Sheet with the full dictionary, the full word list all the tables about how the grammar works and stuff for the language on go.org after this video comes out. So keep in mind, you could always access that to really improve and foment your language learning experience. And not only that, but you want to properly be able to type out the actual gum smack notation. There is actually an easy solution for that. How do you think I generated these PNGs? Well, Eternal, of course, designed and programmed a magical Rosetta Stone of a device that he calls the Gum Smacker. There's also going to be a link and instructions on how to download and use the Gum Smacker on onga.org after this video comes out. I'm just going to do a brief demonstration real quick. I've already downloaded the Gum Smacker. Again, there will be instructions on how to do this on onga.org after the video comes out. But I've got Gum Smacker installed. I need to open up a Windows terminal of some sort. You could do it on the command prompt, or you could download the Windows terminal, etc. To change my directory to the proper location real quick. Okay, so we're in the Gumsmacker now. Get in gumsmacker.exe. Yeah, you gotta do point backslash gumsmacker.exe. You'll be, you'll be warned against what you're doing here. And if thou gaze long into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into thee, aborted and sunken into despair. Idola of prodigious ineptitude may avail in their pitiable selves of H, which is just like the help command. Um, so, you go from there, slash, get your gumsmacker.exe, hit spacebar, and then you can go in to whatever textual formats you have. We're gonna take the he ran quickly sentence, paste it in here, hit enter, and then it'll just enter like that. That means no error has occurred. And you'll go in to gumsmacked.png and it will open exactly the sentence that you just typed in, which is pretty awesome, right? So now you can properly write gumsmack like this. You could fake it. You could just type out a bunch of emojis. You could type out the emoji and a number, blah, 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 but come on. You want to be polite to the native gum smack speakers, right? You have to do it in the proper format. You're probably dying inside right now. Well, I've got a couple other things to just seal the, uh, the deal. Make things even worse, right? How about this sentence? I ate lunch with a girl yesterday. Which, a direct translation would kind of be like, Yesterday, lunch was eaten by this mouth with a bite of girl. Because it's not the girl, it's a girl, so you have to specify that it's a bite of girl. She's solid, though. Um, will be pronounced as... Some more gum. So I can properly smack. Isn't that just poetic? It makes every sentence just such a joy to say and to listen to. 
A conversation about food this long, it cannot and will not end without a reference to chowder. So, you know what they say, when you hear that theme song start playing, the moon and the sun are taken by that mouth. Everything that tastes like fun is taken by that mouth. They are stirred by that mouth. And when it has been done by that mouth, rada 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 ra ra da. So may the room be entered, may looking be done by that mouth. <laughs> may a bite of time be spent by that mouth, because cooking is always smelled. <laughs> may the room be entered, may looking be done by that mouth. May a bite of time be spent by that mouth, because cooking is always smelled. Or... Oh, I thought this would hurt less than Hyper Pirate. Oh, it's like cramping my jaw. <laughs> I mean, it's I mean, perfectly easy and ergonomic to do while chewing food. Complete. You could totally have conversations this way. Oh, it's so good, so good. I hope you. I, I'm literally like covered in saliva right now. I like. Oh God. This is how people eat, right? <laughs> God damn it. Okay. <laughs> That's it for now. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. Now, before we go, I just want to say I'm very glad to be back for my vacation. I'm very glad to be back here making disturbing videos like this and some more, maybe slightly more serious videos, too. Um, so many thanks to the patrons on, on Patre Patreon. Um, I think we're at like $44 a month right now as, as of this, the recording of this video, which is just amazing. Like, that's crazy. I feel like that's a pretty high ratio of Patreon dollars per subscriber number. Speaking of subscriber number, we're about to reach 2,000 subscribers. And as we reach 2,000 subscribers, I'm going to be releasing a Q&A video. I know, I know, super original. 
But yeah, no, I'm gonna be doing a Q Q and A. People have been asking questions both on a community post on here, but mostly, vast majority on Discord. So the Discord server super fun. Um, you should join the Discord server, join our lovely little community, get on the Minecraft server. Season 2 of the uh, Minecraft live stream is going to be beginning within the next month or so, that's going to be fun. And last, big announcement, if you haven't um, been like super keeping up or if you're new here, I just released a book. Yes, that is right, I am a published author, I have a book published and released and available to purchase on Amazon. It is a grammar of the Autojune language. Autojune being, you know, one of my main actually serious languages, you know, a more naturalistic one, the one that I did my thesis presentation on, um, that was like the original basis for this channel. Yeah, that's a book now. It includes history, grammar, you can learn the language, you can learn a lot of cool phrases and cultural information and stuff about the Fuanal Peninsula. That's been like the real passion project of mine for many, many years. It's available on Amazon for 22 US dollars. I'm gonna put a link to that in the description as well. Um, that is pretty much it. This was painful, um, both to make, to think about, and I'm sure I caused a lot of pain to all of you for having to listen to all of this. This is going to be a doozy to edit. This is going to be absolutely glorious. I'm gonna relax after this, and I'm not going to chew gum for a long time. Please, if you appreciate this, or if you thought this was so bad that it's worth feigning appreciation, you know, like, comment, subscribe. Subscribe especially, because 2000. Become a patron on Patreon, so that I could get out of the negative $700 that I, I mean, God, I love all of you very much. I appreciate everyone who watches this video and everyone who subscribes and everyone on the Discord server. You're all amazing. We are the most glorious part of the internet. I love you all. Uh, until next time, not out. Jerry Seinfeld, this really hurt. This is the book, by the way. I have it in person. It's a cool book.